So thank you, Mark. That was uh, quite interesting. I think if I ever get on a Scrum team that uh, falls a little bit behind in terms of development, we're definitely going to give you a call. You really flopped through a lot of code there, so uh, great job. Uh, this is the last talk of uh, this event. Uh, thank you all for staying around. Uh, I know we're butting up against lunch, so trying to uh, try to get through this and, and leave a little room for questions if there are any, and then ultimately uh, you guys will be able to, uh, to eat. So I've already gone too fast. Uh, automated testing for digital experiences, specifically with JUnit 5, is the topic of my talk today. A little bit about myself. My name is Mike Colino. I'm the CTO and head of cloud computing over at Solstice, the primary sponsor for today's day of the conference. Uh, as my colleague Aaron Rosen, er, Eric Rosenzweig talked about this morning, Solstice is a digital innovation consulting firm here in Chicago. We primarily focus on building digital, uh, digital experiences, specifically for Fortune 1000 companies. Uh, we're recently getting involved in uh, not only the Java community here, but also the Spring community. So again, uh, just a pleasure to be in front of you guys today. My background is I've got uh, about 15 plus years in enterprise development and architecture across uh, a wide ver variety of technologies and programming languages. And as part of my tenure at Solstice for the last five years, I've worked with over 40 enterprise, Fortune 1000 enterprises in terms of building digital solutions, both back end and front end. As Eric mentioned this morning, Solstice is a digital innovation firm that we really focus on three different areas. The first is we help our customers reimagine digital experiences um, and really take uh, pride in the work that we do in terms of uh, acquiring customers, new customers, as well as engaging existing ones. The second is we design and build new digital products. So we're moving into, obviously, a digital, the, the digital age uh, of not only uh, new digital products, but connected products as well. Um, so we, we take a lot of uh, things that exist in the physical world uh, and transform them into digital experiences. And then lastly, we help with digital operations and companies get off the ground when it comes to digital. Just real quick, I want to run through the agenda today. Um, no surprise, this is a talk about testing, so we are going to talk about tests. But more specifically, we're going to talk about the significance of what tests have become. We're going to take a look back in terms of where we've been uh, through the lens of Java Spring and JUnit 4. But more importantly, we're going to look at where we're going in terms of JUnit 5. And then lastly, it wouldn't be a Solstice talk without some sort of digital experience demo. Um, we've got users of Slack here. Has anyone played around with building bots for Slack? Super simple, super fun. Uh, we're going to go through that, uh, just a quick example of that, and then tie that back to some tests that we wrote with, with JN and 5. OK, it is really, today, all about the tests. Um, I challenge you, as I did myself when I sat down to, to, to come up with this talk and think about how I was introduced to automated testing. Uh, and it's really scary, at least if you're like me, uh, I couldn't believe how vivid the memories were. I mean, it's on par with the day I got married, the day my kids were born, like, it's, it's kind of scary. <laughs> but uh, I was working at, this was 13, 14 years ago, I was working as a junior developer, small firm, small team, um, recently onboarded a code base that I had not constructed. Uh, our lead developer came up to me and said, you know, we're getting a lot of uh, uh, defects coming in from a regression standpoint in terms of the tests that the QA teams are running. We'd like to build a set of a test suite of unit tests to cover our existing code base so that we can cut down on the number of regression test defects that we're getting. Um, if you're like me, you understand that you know, that particular practice of trying to create a test suite of unit tests over an, not only an existing code base where there isn't any test coverage in place, but also in a code base that you weren't the one of the original contributors to is very problematic. And it's also not the best way to learn how to approach unit testing as a whole. But ultimately, I made it through it. And what's, what's transpired over the last couple years uh, specifically is the fact that tests are becoming more and more important in our environments today. Well, why is that? First, we live in a TDD, CI, CD focused world, right, where modern software engineering techniques are highly value the automation, that, any automation that we can put in place, specifically with automated tests as well. 
our tests have actually expanded. So what started out, at least for a, a majority of folks that I know and work with, um, automated tests were in the format of unit tests to start. But we've gone beyond that at this point. We're working with integration tests, system tests, functional tests. Um, so the, expand, the, the scope of which we rely on automated testing has expanded. And then finally, the development and build tools that we're using today, we've seen a sort of a, a, a good, healthy mix of them. Um, all of them have testing support directly built into them. And so in doing that, those particular tools are lowering the bar as to what we need to do to be able to write tests while we're building software, but also making it easier for us to add to existing test suites that we've constructed. Okay, how many people in the audience using JUnit 4 today? Yeah, I, I saw a recent survey that of all the Java public um, uh, repos out on GitHub that JUnit 4 is one of the most uh, prominent libraries that's being used. That's the good thing. The bad thing is that uh, the current version of JUnit, or I should say JUnit 4, was actually introduced back in 2006. Um, and so very few things exist in the technology domain today that last for over 10 years. Um, and so that along with the fact uh, that the, cha the technologies around us have changed. So again, Solstice being uh, focused in the digital domain, we've seen a bunch of changes. Uh, so 2007, the first iPhone release, 2008, the first GitHub repo, Slack launching in 2013, and then finally, Java 8 being released, released in 2014. So a lot has, has changed in the, in the world around us, as well as there's a, a significant time frame where Java or JUnit 4 has had a dominant role in, in automated testing. But that's not to say that it doesn't have its own problems, uh, specifically gaps that uh, we've either been trying to solve or have been able, unable to solve, uh, which has really pivoted uh, the community to come up with the next version of, of JUnit. So let's take a look at, at what some of those gaps are today. So first and most prominent is tight coupling. So today, if you're a developer, the API that you're using to write test cases with or to write tests with is coupled from a deployment and from an architecture standpoint with the discovery and execution APIs, right? So Sam Brennan, one of the, the core committers of, of previous versions of JUnit refers to this as the big ball of mud, right? We've got this tightly coupled uh, situation, basically a monolithic architecture, and we've got competing forces as to should we enhance the developer API, should we enhance the dev and build tool test API, and then correspondingly, how do we handle that in terms of deployment, backwards compatibility, et cetera. The other main problem with JUnit 4 is that it's built on top of JUnit 5, or uh, on top of Java 5, which makes it basically unable to make relevant use of modern language features such as Lambda, right? So that's just a, another prominent problem with JUnit 4. And then lastly, there's points of friction that the community just hasn't been able to, uh, to, to solve. We've tried to patch some things with rules and runners, but there's restrictions on those. Um, ultimately, there's just something left to be desired in terms of uh, the developer experience. Luckily for us, JUnit 5 is on the horizon. Um, I'm not sure if people are familiar, but JUnit 5 Milestone 4 was released back in April of this year, and the GA release is planned for later this summer, early this fall. Let's take a look at the new features that are being unveiled in JUnit 5 and ultimately how they can help you in terms of your quest for writing automated tests. So the most admirable feature for JUnit 5 is the modularization of the tool itself. The uh, corresponding framework is going to be uh, deconstructed and decomposed and decoupled into three specific components. The first is going to be called JUnit Platform, which is going to act as that API that the development and build tools that we love today are going to use to discover tests and to execute tests. The second component, conveniently called JUnit Jupiter, the fifth planet from the sun, also conveniently starting with JU, contains the developer APIs that you're going to use to write tests. And then lastly, the third component is something that they're called JUnit Vintage, which allows you to run legacy tests that were either constructed using JUnit 3 or JUnit 4. 
And finally, JUnit 5's rewrite is built on Java 8, which now introduces the ability to use Lambda inside of our tests. I was expecting an applause there, perhaps. <laughs> OK. So we talked about the architecture. I want to dive a little bit into uh, the programming model is pretty much the same. Uh, I want to dive into the points of extensibility. Then we'll go through some of the new tests and some of the annotations as well. Let me take a drink real fast. OK. In terms of the extension model for JUnit 5, it allows for developers to hook into different test lifecycle events via an extension. And so this architecture, in terms of JUnit 5 extensibility, is really focusing on what they're calling extension points. So what are some of these points of extension? Well, there are specific events that we can hook into, callbacks, uh, either before a test ex executes, or before, or I should say, after a test executes, or we can do it up at the test container level as well. Here is the before each callback extension that I've actually pulled down directly from the source in GitHub. Um, here we can see uh, this is essentially just an interface. Um, it actually takes a, uh, a parameter called test extension context. What's interesting is that once these extensions are actually registered, uh, there's no deterministic way as to know when these instances, these extension classes, are created and then subsequently garbage collected. And so because of that, the framework provides a store uh, because these corresponding callbacks need to be stateless. And then the store is basically just a key value map that we can, if we want to, and we'll see it in the next slide, uh, if we want to store information, persist it, and then potentially read it back from the store, uh, we can do that to allow them to stay stateless. Okay, so this is a extension. Um, this is uh, an example that I pulled from the user's guide. Uh, it's basically just a timing extension, and it's going to take advantage of the be before test execution and the after test execution. Uh, ultimately, what we're going to do here is we're going to get the current time before the test starts. We're going to get the, uh, the current time when the test completes. We're going to determine what that duration is, and then we're just going to log that out. And then ultimately, uh, this particular implementation in the corresponding extension class is actually going to be registered using the extends with annotation on top of the actual test container itself. Make sense? Okay. okay. Another interesting new feature is the ability to use parameters in, inside of tests. So this allows developers to essentially pass parameters into their tests. So you can see we've got the, uh, in a similar way, these uh, parameters are actually uh, mapped through and extends with annotation as well. We'll look at the actual implementation of that extension class. But ultimately, you can see inside the method signature here that we're passing in what's probably a, a, a POJO mock system. Um, and that's going to ultimately be able to be used directly inside the test method itself. Okay, now in order to create a, a situation where you can pass a parameter into a test, you have to actually extend um, a, a class that's actually provided with, with JUnit uh, called the parameter resolver. And then ultimately, you have to support and provide implementation for two different methods. The first is the supports method, which basically says uh, from, a, from a, a validation standpoint that I'm expecting an object of mock system essentially to verify that that's the corresponding type of the class that I'm trying to use or instantiate. And then the second is a method called resolve, where we're actually just passing back the instance of the class that we want to use, as well as any initialization that we want to take on top of uh, once that object is created. OK, that was the new prominent features for extensibility in JN5. Next, I want to cover the different types of tests that are being introduced as part of JUnit 5. The first is dynamic tests. So while many people in the audience, many developers in the audience are, are going to be building tests that are going to be known at compile time, dynamic tests allow for us to basically create tests that are going to be 
evaluated at runtime, uh, which is really nice and also feeds in very well to the ability to use uh, uh, Lambda functions as well. Okay. Dynamic tests are denoted using the test factory annotation. Dynamic test methods need to return a stream, a collection, or some sort of iterable in terms of dynamic tests. So you can see here, I've got two different instances of dynamic tests. Those will be evaluated, um, and then those assertions will be made at runtime. Other new testing conventions that are available. So now we have, inside of JUnit 5, something called parameterized tests. So if we want to provide a list of of use cases and corresponding parameter values in terms of the test that we have that we want to run. We can simply do that by annotating with a parameterized test and then using the value source an annotation to include the corresponding types and the values that we want to run as part of this particular test. And then finally, we have something that's called repeated tests. So if I have a specific test that I want to run, a certain number of times, every time that I kick off my test suite, uh, I can essentially label it with the repeated test annotation as well as the number of times that I want that test to run. Okay, lastly, we've got a couple new annotations that are available in JUnit 5. I don't know why anyone would ever want to disable a test. I've never needed to do that in my entire life, but if you do need to do that, <laughs> I would certainly question anyone who does want to disable a test why they would want to disable a test. But, um, okay, so the disabled annotation was added in order to disable individual test cases, or I'm sorry, test containers or individual tests. So here you can see I'm using the annotation at the class level, and I can do the same thing down at the, at the test level as well. Display name, how many of us have been caught in a regression type scenario where our test suite kicks off, we see some test that we probably wrote years ago failed, it's 50 characters long in terms of its name, you have no idea what that test is doing. So then you have to go back to the code, you have to look at the test, you have to say, oh, okay, this is what it's doing. Well, conveniently, as part of JUnit 5, they've added a display name annotation, so if you want to put friendlier names on your test so that you can understand in those situations what that test is actually doing. Uh, it's a nice little handy feature as well. Oops, sorry, missed that. And then finally, uh, if you're familiar with categories in JUnit 4, um, it's been uh, the tag annotation will actually supersede. Um, and ultimately, the tag annotation basically allows us to group tests specifically across containers in a more uh, in an easier way uh, to, 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 to align and filter what specific tests are being run for. So uh, the actual tag name itself is available in that test execution context and that test execution or test container execution context as well. And we can both set tags at both the test container level as well as the test level as well. Okay, those are the new prominent features in JUnit 5. I want to walk you through a demo at this point. We'll go to the demo first, we'll run it, uh, then we'll circle back, we'll look at some unit tests and some of these features in action. Uh, but before I do, I want to kind of set up the demo here a little bit. So we've got a Spring Boot application, which is essentially just a REST endpoint with a corresponding controller. Uh, what we're going to do is simulate a Slack bot. So has anyone here built a Slack bot? I saw the hands for Slack. Slack bot? Okay. Cool. Um, so we're using a, uh, a dependency called JBot. It makes it extremely simple. Uh, the code will actually be posted up on the repository online. It's already linked to the, the keynote. So it will be made available to you. I encourage you not only to check out the test that we've written, but also to just play around with with not only uh, Slack bots, but bots in general. They're, they're a ton of fun. So. Um, but ultimately, what we're going to do is we're going to simulate a customer service bot inside of, or I'm sorry, a customer support bot inside of Slack. Um, and so as the user, I'm going, to, I'm going to Slack and direct message the bot, and I'm going to say, can I reset my password? And so we've created a password intent 
up at our natural language processor, so we're using API.ai behind the scenes. We've configured the corresponding language that we want to be able to use in terms of the request coming from the user to recognize that the user wants to reset their password. Um, now, before they can reset their password, the bot's actually going to challenge them with a security question. If they get the security question wrong, we're going to make a call out to Giphy, and we're going to present an epic fail GIF inside of Slack. So hopefully this will, this will be a fun experience. Uh, I'm going to switch my displays at this point, and I'm going to hop over to both the code and as well as to Slack. Okay. So I just want to kind of go through this uh, pretty quickly in terms of the objects that we're using. Um, got a couple of POJOs here. We've got a customer class, which basically contains an ID, a username, a password, a first name, and then ultimately a collection of security questions. Um, and so that's the other POJO that we'll be working with. The security questions class basically has an ID, a question, and an answer. We created a customer a CRUD repository similar to the one that Mark was showing earlier, where we basically just see the repo with a bunch of different Slack users, our IDs, our names, um, and then all of that information in terms of, uh, well, at least for the ID, will be passed in uh, to the actual um, uh, handler uh, on, the, on the server. The, uh, all of the magic is actually happening here inside of this handle custom message function. So the customer ID will be passed in. The message will be passed in. We'll go out and we'll fetch the corresponding customer. We'll get the first security question that they have inside of their collection of questions. Uh, we'll determine what the actual intent is. So if it's to reset the password, then the next step is to go out and, and ask uh, uh, the uh, corresponding security question, and then if we're at the point where we're uh, requesting the action of getting past the security question, we'll check the validity of the answer. If so, we'll, we'll uh, change the password. If not, we'll get the epic fail GIF. Uh, so this is basically a, a Spring Boot application under the hood. So I'm going to start this up. I'm going to come over to Slack, uh, and we should see the bot come online here in a second. I needed to clear the messages associated with, um, in terms of the conversation I was having with the bot, not to give away all the cool features that you'll see in terms of this epic fail GIF. So, I'm going to make sure that I'm up and running. Yep. See it online yet? Oh, there it is. Perfect. All right. So, customer support rep. You set my password. The bot's going to come back. It's going to have the context information associated with my user ID. And it should ask me the first corresponding security question associated with my account. Interesting. All right, let's give this one more shot, and then we'll switch over to the test, and then we've got a public version that we can deploy out to the cloud in terms of the listener. We can circle back to that. While we're waiting, though, um, just to, to show you, uh, I'm going to start going into some of the unit tests that are available um, or some of the unit tests that we've created. One of, the, one of the main questions that we have when we have this conversation is, um, I've got an existing suite of JUnit 4 test cases. I want to start writing test cases in JUnit 5. Can I do that? Absolutely. So you see inside of this particular uh, corresponding test container, I've got two JUnit 4 tests. And then I can run this as well using uh, the JUnit 5 framework. Also, I can key in and use 
those annotations that I was, I was talking about in terms of display name and uh, who's running my tests. Okay, we'll let this run one more time, and then um, what I'll do is I'll just continue to go through the, the corresponding tests here. Um, so we have, in terms of password reset, we have the ability to essentially not only reset the password, but determine the length of the password. It's basically just a, a random mashup of uh, a, a bunch of uh, legal characters. So in this particular example, we want to not only test uh, the, the the randomness of that, but we also want to test and verify that the length of the password, in terms of however long that we have instructed it to be, actually um, provides back the a string of that particular length. So here's an example of a, uh, a corresponding parameterized tests. Um, inside of the, the next test class that we've created is um, where we're also injecting, uh, you saw that customer POJO object previously. Um, here inside of this particular set of, of test cases, I've had to inject, or I wanted to inject that particular customer object as well. And in order to do that, if you remember, I had to actually use a resolver. So inside of my folder here, we can see the actual resolver implementation. As I stated, the first method of uh, supports ultimately determines whether or not uh, I'm returning a viable customer class. And then the resolve method is not only creating an instance of customer, but also uh, passing in the corresponding seeded values of, of initialization that I want to run with, um, with the test itself. Okay, let's try this again. It's back online, fingers crossed. Reset my password. All right. So, hi Mike, I can help with that. All I need to do is get the answer to one security question. In what city do you believe the world's best spring developers reside? I'm gonna say, it's gotta be San Francisco. No, I'm, I know it's not. You realize this is the city of Alpha Chrome, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's true, it's true. I'll watch my back as I walk out the door today. Um, so as you can see, the, the bot responded back, basically saying I cannot help with that request. Okay. All right, I'm gonna try this one more time. I'm gonna provide it the right answer. I'm gonna say reset my password. And I'm gonna respond with the right answer this time. Chicago, success, a new password, and it provides me with a new password. So that was the demo. We got through it, thankfully. Uh, one last point that I'll make. Uh, we can use multiple extensions inside of our test cases. Um, so there were some, uh, some, some constraints around that in the, in the past with Jane and 4. Uh, you can also uh, bring in some of the other extensions, like a Makito extension if you're if you're doing mock, uh, spring extensions, um, all of those are available to you. Uh, those can be injected into your tests as well. Uh, there are a couple of new assertions uh, in terms of, uh, for example, you can assert whether or not something's going to throw an exception or not, which is, which is great. Um, and then there's some others that take advantage of or are easier to, to sort of use uh, with Lambda expressions, uh, which again are new and available to us all once, uh, once we start using GM5. That's all I had. Any questions? Um, are there cases in which you would use non-JGNIT testing frameworks like, let's say, Spock? Or, or testing uh, like testing Yeah. Um, it's really a personal, it's a personal preference. I'm a big fan of actually using uh, assert J for assertions. So it's really plug and play in terms of what, you want, what you're comfortable with. Um, I think the, the JUnit team themselves will say, you know, if you're more comfortable with something else or you want to look at a tool like a assert J because it provides extended functionality past what comes out of the box here, more power to you. So. Personal preference.
Question in the back? Uh, great question. Um, So ignore it actually is executed as well. Ignore doesn't get executed. Disable just—it's just whether or not it shows up by your customer. Oh, I gotcha. So to to repeat the question, is there a difference between ignore and disable? And it sounds like the ignore is basically it won't show up on the report. Disable it shows up on the report. It just shows up as disabled. So ignore is the one that you want to use when your boss is asking for a unit test coverage report. <laughs> and disable. Good question, though. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for your time. I enjoyed being here.